Hello and welcome back to another Doctor Who well, Big Finish video and today's Doctor Who Big Finish video I'll be taking a look at this, the third Doctor Adventures of Volume 7 featuring a Season 7 and Season 11 style story. Now this box set is very exciting because it is the first third Doctor Adventure box set to be entirely made of recasts. So we've got Tim Trelaw, we've got Daisy Ashford, we've got Sadie Miller and John Coleshaw. So this is very exciting. Now for some people that might be utter horror because I know some people aren't too keen on the recasts but I have to say that Big Finish have been very tasteful and very tactful in doing them. They've slowly introduced um, the recasts and now we can finally get a box set like this and I think that it is a wonderful thing because we can explore different areas of Doctor's eras what weren't, uh, weren't really touched by Big Finish because of obvious reasons but now we can explore the beginning and the end of the third Doctor. Now this box set comprises of two stories, The Unzile Incursion by Mark Wright and The Golf by Tim Foley. So I'm going to do the presentation for this release and then go on to my thoughts on both of the stories. So if we take a look at this cover art, we've got a lovely green background to represent sort of the alien planet of the Gulf. Then we've got the Unzile Vanguard there about to invade Earth. We've got Liz, Sarah Jane, the Hotspur Network there, the Pertwee Vortex, the Third Doctor looking very concerned, the Brigadier the Purple Sea and the Spindrifter, one of the Unzile drones and good old Bessie and then we have the Third Doctor Adventures, the Unzile Incursion and the Gulf. The side of the release and the back release there so if you know more about the stories then do feel free to pause and the total running time for this box set is 240 minutes. Taking a look at the leaflet now so if we open it up we have production credits for this release and some of the cast members what feature within this release and then we have the cast list for each story there, the Unzile Incursion and the Gold. That wise the disc art is exactly the same for basically all four discs as you can see, the Unzile Incursion and then we have the Golf disc art there. Moving on to the review of the story, so the Unzile Incursion, so rather fittingly to start off volume 7 we have a season 7 style story um, which is the first full cast adventure of the era Big Finish have done now this story was my most anticipated of the set, as I adore season 7 and the information we were given before this set was released, you know, having its own custom intro sting like the Ambassador of Death, which honestly gave me goosebumps, um, just by having that little detail, it just made it feel so authentic to the era, it was just absolutely wonderful. Um, but what about the actual story itself? Was it a successful incursion into the Pertwee era? Or did the Brigadier fire five round rapid at the story? Well, I thought that this was a triumph. The story really captured the tone and feel of the early Pertwee era. From great action sequences mixed in with a conspiracy thriller, this is definitely one not to miss. So let's dive right into the story. One thing to note that you can listen to the first 15 minutes of the Unzal Incursion on the Big Finish podcast. Um, I'll leave a link in the description below. And the first full episode of the Golf. Um, again, I'll leave a link in the description below so you can check out um, those if you want to have a little taste of the actual story themselves. So part one, we start off the story with a bang, with the unit squad training at Fulcrum, what runs a military training simulation with the Brigadier checking out the facility to see how his new squad's doing, um, which is led by Sergeant Atta, and the Fulcrum is run by Sherilyn Dankworth. And seeing the Brigadier not, isn't really that impressed with the uh, Fulcrum. With him being an old soldier, you know, you learn on experience, you know, you learn your experience on the field, not in a simulation. So you can see that the Brigadier is very resistant to new ways. So I like that it shows for him, him being sort of an old soldier, really. Meanwhile, Liz is busy developing the Hotspur Network, which is an early warning satellite program to detect any aliens and how to deal with them effectively. While the Fur Doctor is just being rather bored and he's sort of become the tea lady with him wanting to help Liz with this project uh, so it will stop him being bored which I think really shows those characters relationships beautifully so off they go to test um, the Hotspur network ready for the grand unveiling later on meanwhile Dankworth begins her own experiment which makes for some psychedelic sound design wonderfully authentic to the 70s as the neutralization begins who is Dankworth working for and why must unit be neutralized? Whilst Dankworth's plan is gaining traction, the unveiling of the Hotspur network to the good old Tubby Rowlands uh, is here. And we continue some lovely moments between the Doctor and Liz, with Liz saying that the Doctor probably feels more comfortable dealing with a horde of Silurians than good old Tubby Rowlands. So you do have the classic Doctor and Brigadier bickering, um, which is great, you know, which is always a joy. And Liz gets a moment to shine 
as the network is activated and as time passes everything is running normal in the unit HQ well normal as unit can get um, Sergeant Atta is settled into the job the doctor is still ignoring the brigadier's phone calls and we do get a nice little um, nod to Corporal Bell within there and we have the doctor you know happy as Larry um, tinkering on the TARDIS but Liz isn't too happy she wants the next scientific frontier with the doctor saying to her well we'll find it together then which I think is a really heartwarming moment between those two characters so this story you could say is the start of Liz thinking about leaving unit um, which I think is a really nice sort of theme to sort of start to play with because you know Liz has had this opportunity to, to develop the Hotspur network and then to suddenly just be passing test tubes and helping the doctor you can tell that Liz is sort of getting itchy feet but that all has to wait as stage two of Danquist's plan begins as unit members start to turn against the doctor Liz and the brigadier causing for a tense final five minutes as Danquist wants access to the hotspur network but Liz being the genius has locked it with a code and unit HQ has gone into lockdown as the doctor and Liz try and escape but the unit soldiers are turning against them there's only one way to escape the TARDIS but that's faulty, so will it be a success? Part two, now this part is the action part, as the TARDIS is fully broken now, and there's only one option to escape, and that is Bessie. And this is absolutely wonderful, so we see the Doctor, Liz and the Brigadier um, leave Unit HQ and Bessie whilst you know being shot at. Now this episode does remind me very much of part three of Inferno, with the Doctor being pursued by the Brigade leader's men. Um, and that was the moment where I fell in love with the third Doctor. Um, and this moment to me is just utterly magical. Um, because it's a scene you wouldn't think would work on audio because it's this chase sequence and, you know, Bessie just driving off with gunfire. But by Jove, it just works incredibly. Benji Clifford is really one of the unsung heroes of this release. So Atta begins her pursuit after Doctor and co. And questions are raised, you know, why are the Brigadier soldiers turning against him? Who is controlling them? You know, but... The, for the Doctor to find the answers for that, he needs a laboratory. Luckily, the Brigadier has a perfect place for that, the Hercules plane from the invasion. So we learn more about the Brigadier's past. While Stankworth activates the drone army, as Sergeant Atta has caught up with the Doctor and co, leading to the Doctor and Liz confronting them, while the Brigadier readies the Hercules for takeoff. So this is a wonderful, tense scene as the Doctor wants to uncover the mystery, but doesn't get any answers, so off they go. So off they go and escape Atta again leading Atta to receive new orders because the Doctor and Liz and the Brigadier are using unorthodox tactics as new tactics are given as the aerial drones are now launched. Uh, meanwhile, the Liz, Brigadier and the Doctor gather all the information that they know. This story really allows all three members of the unit team to shine, allowing for some excellent character interactions as Liz uses the signal code and begins to triangulate the signal to find the origin. Meanwhile, Dankworth is answering to her masters, the Unzal, who are troubled by the Doctor's presence as the Doctor could stop the incursion. And can the Doctor be conditioned to work for the Unzal? The Hercules crew have found the origin and it all leads back to the Fulcrum, but the aerial drones have found them, leading to the Brigadier to use his pilot skills. Now this is when you can really picture sort of the CSO um, of the sort of the aeroplane cockpit with the drones flying past and shooting at the the plane is just absolutely wonderful and we get a really touching moment between the Doctor and the Brigadier um, and the Hercules is about to crash and this is all very thrilling. Part 3, Liz is on her own and the Doctor's caring for the Brigadier as he's dislocated his shoulder and the Doctor goes off to find Liz but it's too late as she's been captured by the drone so Liz is off to the Fulcrum Institute meanwhile Astra and the squad go after to find the Doctor and the Brigadier. So this part is allows for some great exploration of the third Doctor and the Brigadier's dynamic, which is super, and Dankworth finally meets Liz, which is a brilliant uh, moment because Liz is taking none of her nonsense and is full of sass. Um, so Dankworth wants the codes to the Hotspur network, but Liz refuses. Enter the Unzal, and we learn their plans plus their brutal tactics to get the codes. And the Doctor and the Brigadier have a plan, and it's in action, but it's a bit too late, but now the Unzal Vanguard can begin to invade the Earth. Part 4, the Vanguard begins to close in on the Earth. The Doctor and the Brigadier are captured, and we learn more about the Fulcrum conditioning process. And we have a touching reunion between the Doctor and Liz, with the Doctor beginning to question about the technology the Unzal use, you know, because this is way advanced for the Unzal, so who gave them the technology? Um, and this is a wonderful bit of writing by Mark Wright for the Third Doctor, as the Third Doctor 
hadn't settled into unit life, so he's very touchy and he wants to escape and be amongst the stars for his quest for knowledge. Um, so we have sort of a clause of access moment. Um, so the Doctor learns the true extent of the Unzol's plan, that they want to invade Britain slowly so they can change the regime and take over the government and slowly take control of the world. But what does Danquith get out of this? And the Brig and Atta are busy trying to stop the drone army leaving so the Unzol can't change the regime. And Liz is busy taking control of the Hotspur network. Meanwhile, the Doctor is busy fighting the Unzol, having Liz save the day. Now, I will say... But that moment does seem a little bit clunky within the actual story. I'm not sure if it's the way it's been written or the, the, the way it's been directed. But it just doesn't seem to be fully realised in the in the story, especially when you're listening to it. It just seems a little bit clunky, but it's still a wonderful scene. So with everything wrapped up and unit life is back to normal, the Brigadier gets a great little speech about unit life. Um, but something is troubling the Doctor. Who sent the Unzal? And we do get a great little, you know, how many beans make five joke. You know, the Doctor thinks that this incursion was a test against UNIT, but this was the first wave, and when will the second um, begin? Now, this is one thing I will say about this story. Listen to it after the theme music is played, because you get a nice little post credit scene, and it reveals who was behind the Unzal incursion. That's all I'm going to say on that, so stay, stay tuned after the credits, because there's a nice little scene after. Right, character time now. The Doctor played by Tim Trelaw. Tim Trelaw does an incredible job and he really does shine, especially in part four. Honestly, listening to this and then listening to volume one, you really can hear the difference on how much he's improved. Character-wise, Mark Wright has done a terrific job of bringing the Techie Time Lord to life with excellent moments with Liz, with him being very proud and him sort of showing off um, his charming side to the action hero bickering with the Brigadier. To him repairing the TARDIS, he really is a space wizard and a scientist without a portfolio. Liz played excellently by Daisy Ashford. Now, Daisy Ashford really does shine within this story because this story allows us to focus on Liz as the first story Daisy Ashford appeared in was Prime Maud, um, playing Liz. And that being a sequel to Inferno and having Joe Grant and introducing John Coulshaw's Brigadier. It's easy to see how sort of Liz got sort of lost within that story. You know, I love Primal, it's a, it's a great story. Um, but having this story, you know, dedicated to Liz, because Liz is very much a central player within this story, it really allows Daisy Ashford to show how brilliant she is playing her mother's character, because we have the sassy wit to her being very sort of calm and collected whilst in danger, very humble and very efficient in getting her work done but yearns for some new challenges and just doesn't really want to pass test tubes to the doctor. So Liz is just absolutely fantastic. And in part three, you know, Liz just absolutely shines. The Brigadier played by John Coleshaw. What can I say? What hasn't been said already? Uh, he's spot on. He's just does a fantastic job of bringing the Brigadier to life. Has some wonderful character modes within this story. We learn more about the Brigadier's military career, his stiff upper lip attitude, mixed with the dry wit with his burst of frustration and disappointment in himself. This is a wonderful story for the Brigadier. Dan Quirf, played by Claire Corbett, a very good performance, bringing this self-righteous character to life, very protective of her work, and quite a cold and snotty character who fits the Pertwee era very well and very determined to achieve her goals. So what am I overall thought on the Unzal incursion? Well, it's a delight, a true treat for any Fur Doctor fan. It is tremendous. You know, wonderful bits of action, incredibly authentic sound design and music, making it feel like a lost season 7 story. The cast are superb, giving it their all. Tim Trelaw continues to excel. Daisy Ashford is allowed to shine bright with a story focusing on Liz, with this beginning the end with her time on unit. And John Coleshaw continues to deliver as the Brigadier. The Unzal are an intriguing monster what fit season 7. I can't express how much joy this story gave me. It was truly marvellous. A wonderful conspiracy thriller and having all the hallmarks of what made this season so special. From the Sting music to the Bessie Chase sequence, this story certainly never has a dull moment, and this story does leave the door open for a sequel. So could Big Finish do a spearhead from space and tear of the Autons? Well, I guess time will tell for that. But yeah, the Unzal incursion definitely lived up to the hype for me. It was just a tremendous story. I loved it, especially part two absolute highlight. I'm going to give this story 9 beans out of 10. Moving on to the gulf now, so we've gone from the start of the third Doctor era to the end of his era uh, with the gulf written by Tim Foley. Now this is Tim Foley's first two disc release and the first full cast 
season 11 style story. So no pressure, Tim Foley. So how did he do? Well, I have to say that this is another classic Big Finish story, with mixing with this story very much being the third Doctor's version of the Waters of Mars. Um, with the bleakness, the story mixed with this very unsettling atmosphere, this was a fantastic off-world adventure for the third Doctor and Sarah. So let's dive in more to the actual story. Part one, again, I'm just going to say it is free on the Big Finish website, so you can check that out. Again, link in the description below, so if you can check out this story, if you like what I say about it. Um, so, part one itself. Instantly, the story starts off on an eerie note, creating the unsettling tone for the story, with the music really enhancing that, with us meeting Penn and Laurel, um, and this really does continue and set the tone with them sort of listening to see if they can hear the sea scream, um, as part one really paints this isolated world beautifully, um, with the story being set on this oceanic world, with this purple poisonous sea, with it being filled with this valuable crystal called Tribax, uh, with the main setting being this spin drifter, what was used as a mining facility, but now is run by Marta, a renowned artist, who now runs this art retreat with a collective of people. Soon to be joining the art collective is the Doctor and Sarah. Now the scene, the first scene they have is just wonderful, showing the chemistry between those two characters, you know, with Sarah joking as the Brigadier left the tap running, um, but despite all this, the Doctor feels very uneasy and he senses that there's a darkness in the sea mist which is very creepy. So off they go to explore the Spin Drifter uh, while we get a great little mini action moment as the walkway collapses leaving the Doctor and Sarah isolated from the TARDIS as there's no other way to get back to the TARDIS. Um, so they're soon sent in front of Martha to be questioned. So is the Doctor and Sarah working for the Barbica? or the depot companies, the benefactors of the Spin Drifter. As we learn that both of those um, companies are at war with each other, so the universe is burning. Now this scene in particular is a great bit of character work again, especially for the Doctor and Marta, as we learn how isolated this small group is with the Doctor giving them a stark warning. Um, so whilst that happens, Sarah's busy learning about the group of people on the Spin Drifter, so both the Doctor and Sarah are being toured around the Spin Drifter and we see how self-sufficient they are with them having their own garden. It's all very nut hutch from the Green Death so it does feel, you know, fit right into the, the Pertwee era in that regard. So we soon find out that they tragically lost an artist called Laurel um, who was washed away in a storm, hence the supporting characters being very suspicious of the Doctor and Sarah and one of Laurel's paintings sort of causes um, quite a stir between the Doctor and Sarah as they notice the screaming sees that there are creatures in there, these sort of mermaid sirens, you know, mixed with these sort of tendrils, um, leaving the Doctor to feel very uneasy as this story really does create an eerie atmosphere. So the Doctor and Sarah want to uncover the mystery. So over dinner we learn more about Martha and how she's linked to Depot, uh, and we learn more about what's as we learn that they were scared away by something and the Doctor is determined to see if the sea really does scream and Sarah being Sarah isn't going to leave the Doctor's side. So over a mug of cocoa we have a really heartfelt moment with Sarah being quite deflated that even in the future there's conflict and it still rages on and the third Doctor has a very classic speech um, but that is soon interrupted by someone breaking in to the Spin Drifter. Cue that music and yeah, that is very 1970s music. Part 2, the return of Laurel but something has happened as Sarah noticed a strange shadow for a second on Laurel's face. But Laurel explains to her events what happened to her but the Doctor is meticulously questioning her leading um, to the Doctor to say to Marta, you need to send a flare now as the Spin Drifter tremors and if it loses power, the Spin Drifter will sink into the water. So this adds even more tension into the atmosphere. The Doctor becoming an engineer and Annette and Laurel have a secret project and one thing I love about this story is how rich the supporting characters are that they all have their own secrets, which I'm not going to spoil. Um, but Sarah, meanwhile, is doing a bit of investigation work. She's looking through some old reports, you know, what scared Depot off, and reports of what the crew sort of faced, you know, with a screaming sea, um, and has sort of nightmares about it, and there's files missing. But that's not the only bit of investigation Sarah does, as she uncovers, finds out Laurel and Yvette's uh, plan involving the Trivax. But who is Laurel communicating with? Once again, this is very good sound design. Um, whilst in the engine room, the Doctor and Marta notice um, that someone's been down in the engine room with sort of the seawater puddles, and there's Trivax, as somebody has been using the mining equipment. Now this is when the story takes an even more sinister, creepy 
tone as Laurel confronts the chef, as Laurel starts exploiting the chef's sadness and her grief, and the chef starts to cry uncontrollably, and in her mind her, the room starts to flood, and you know the tears start to form of this very strange creature, leaving the chef to have this sort of blood-curdling scream which is just horrible, and the chef's body becomes a husk with the doctor confronting the creature and Laurel, as Laurel has a psychic shadow, leading to a very classic cliffhanger. Part 3 we have an action start as the creature and Laurel pursue the Doctor, Martha and Lynette, and we expand on the creature, um, you know, with what they look like, because they're exactly the same thing what Laurel painted, and we learn more about the spin drifter, and why is Salt the answer to this mystery, as we get the answer of why everyone's feeling so uneasy, and this part we explore more of Martha's backstory and her hatred towards Barbica, um, as they're trapped in Martha's room with Laurel taunting them, saying that she can free them from their trauma, manipulating them to get their tears as the gulf is revealed, and how they formed in the spin drifter. But the spin drifter systems are failing, um, with it sinking and the mystery of what's in the pipe. And this is when we get a very Waters of Mars moment as the toxic sea water bursts through and Laurel claims another victim. And those scenes are just really horrifying to listen to. Um, and we do have a lovely little reference to Stolen Earth with the TARDIS, you know, with the Doctor saying, oh, the TARDIS can um, tow a planet and one day he'll uh, show Sarah of that. And uh, he definitely did, um, quite a few incarnations later. The Doctor and Laurel make a deal to stop all this, um, but Laurel says that the Doctor must go outside to confront her, leading to the Doctor to be washed away by the sea, leading to a very mysterious cliffhanger. Part 4 again, we have a very action-packed start with Sarah and Martha escaping the Gulf and Laurel and the third Doctor is underwater which is a very eerie moment as he finally comes face to face with the Gulf as he enters the realm of the Gulf which is a nice little reference to the Omega's mind when he's in Omega's sort of domain as the Gulf is a collection of tortured souls um, and the third Doctor is very defiant you know, as he defies it because he crosses a void beyond the mind, which is a lovely little reference and I didn't expect it and it did give me a little chuckle. Now Martha has her own plan, but the third doctor manages to escape the gulf. You know, the sea has scorched his jacket and burnt his face, so that's a very striking image, you know, to see the third doctor looking a bit worse for wear. Um, but the third doctor takes charge as the spin drifter only has 20 minutes left before it sinks. And we have one final confrontation with Laurel, leading to a very bleak ending with the Doctor, Sarah and Marta rowing to safety with Marta having a very difficult choice to make and the last scene being very reflective on the events what happened within the story. Moving on to characters now, the third Doctor played by Tim Trelaw, another marvellous performance this time showing off the suave charming nature of the third Doctor especially towards Marta. Moments of the third Doctor being a fanboy showing his admiration to Marta and this story allows us to have a different side to the third Doctor's character as the third Doctor feels very, constantly feels uneasy, um, which really sells the fear factor as the third Doctor is this very strong, defiant character, you know, that he doesn't show fear. Um, so when he does show sort of signs of fear, you know that things aren't all that they seem. So I really like that Tim Foley starts to explore a different nature of the third Doctor, but still has the traditional third Doctor, what we all know and love. Sadie Miller um, plays Sarah Jane, Wonderful performance by Sadie Miller, it's scarily good and you can definitely see how much more relaxed she is in the role. As Return of a Cyberman, though is a good story, it really didn't let Sadie shine. Um, so this story really allows us to have more of a playful Sarah. You know, you can really picture Sarah pulling a funny face or rolling her eyes. And this story really utilises her sort of inquisitive nature and her investigation skills and that classic stubbornness. Honestly, this is a great story for Sarah, and Sadie Miller just excels in every moment. And then we have Marta, played by Wendy Craig, a brilliant uh, performance playing this cheery, artistic character. You know, got a good few sort of sarky lines there, but a very welcoming uh, character. Almost feels very much like a mother hen, and sort of when Laurel went missing, you really get that sort of sense of loss conveyed within the performance. And a very interesting character backstory, which makes her feel like a very rich character and very well rounded as well. Then we have Laurel herself, um, played by Lucy Goldie, um, who was in The Grey Man of Mountain. Wonderful story and wonderful performance in that, and this is again an excellent performance, this once reckless character, um, you know, but now has become a very sort of sinister, manipulative character, but very troubled at the same time, who feels constantly on edge, very uptight, and just is a real delight hearing her play a villain. And those scenes when she's tormenting the other characters is just really 
sort of spine chilling, great performance. So my overall thoughts on the Golf is, it's a brilliantly atmospheric story, what holds the atmosphere throughout, it sustains a deep mystery, wonderfully rich supporting characters, allowing for some touching moments um, with their hidden secrets. The third Doctor and Sarah dynamic is captured superbly from the heartfelt moment for one another, and Sadie Miller really does shine, and Tim Trelaw is a delight bringing this soft, charming third Doctor to life. The golf is such a haunting creation, the music feels wonderfully authentic to the era. This is a base under siege story meets gothic horror of the Hinchcliffe era with a touch of the waters of Mars. This is a perfectly crafted adventure, and what better way to start season 11 on audio. So I absolutely love the golf. Again, I'm going to give this story a well-deserved 9 out of 10. So what are my concluding thoughts on the Third Doctor Adventures Volume 7? Well, I think that this is my favourite of the Third Doctor Adventure box sets. This is such a brave endeavour, a new frontier in the Third Doctor Adventures line, exploring new territories in the form of Season 7 and Season 11 um, in full cast. It's just absolutely wonderful. The, the cast are just really superb. The Unzal incursion is just so authentic to Season 7. I can't tell you. It's just absolutely stunning from the music, from the action sequences. It just has so much going on. It's never, It just never stops. There's never a dull moment. It's just fully relentless action with a great conspiracy mystery behind it all. It is wonderful. Then you have the flip side of that with the golf. It's a very um, self-contained isolated story and you really do feel isolated within the the gulf you really get that sort of sense of dread and ominous horror it just feels very eerie and it's just a wonderful creepy listen it is wonderful it's a great story um you know the cast like i said are absolutely superb and i really do recommend this box set. it's just a real triumph by big finish and just shows that how far big finish have come with the recast because it is just a tremendous box set and I'm really excited for Volume 8 because if it's the same quality as this box set, we're in for a treat. And, you know, October, we've got, you know, um, Joe back. We've got Sarah Jane and the Brigadier. And then we have a River Song box set in the form of, you know, a Season 7 box set with Liz and the Brigadier. So we're basically getting all the Third Doctor companions in one, in one month, really, which is so exciting. So that concludes this review. I hope you have enjoyed it. I'll see you next time for more Big Finish related content. So if you've enjoyed this review, then please do like and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. And I'll see you next time for more Big Finish related content. So thank you very much and goodbye.